Okay, oh, it's loud. Good evening, everybody. Um, <laughs> Alan Johnson here, Prior on Photo Products. I guess a little bit of history or background. About many years ago, I started the Suzuki Ford Drive Club, and I was the first person to be a, a traitor by myself in NA Series for Gero, <laughs> one of the very first sold in Australia. So we travelled a long way, a little 2.6 spectral for Gero, and we moved on to many other cars. So there's a long association with the Geros. Well, tonight's presentation is basically about all things electrical. So I guess is because it's a very interesting sort of topic, if anybody's got any questions as we go along, if you want to stick your hand up or yell out, we'll try and answer questions as we go. It's hard to go back and remember the answers, so it's easier. So we have a bit of a, uh, three, three elements to this tonight. We have a, a PowerPoint presentation which I'll turn through. We have a short video we can show you. And if we can get the internet to fire up and work, we've actually got a pretty exciting little project. It's a side project. We're building the first electric solar powered car if you try and attempt to cross the Simpson Desert, which is uh, pretty exciting. So we've actually uh, been working on this for five years now, and it's finally come to fruition. Anyway, there's a video I've been testing together for Maryville if it works. So we'll get on with the PowerPoint first part, and let's crack it up. Let's go. Right, well, first of all, I guess one of the big areas we're setting out on is, is changes in alternative technology. So we want to talk about that. Battery technology has changed dramatically because over the early years we only really had wet cell batteries, now there's all sorts of different chemistries. We'll talk about what the AOCs and show you a video on that, where to use it, and as I say, we'll do questions as we go. So, uh, all right, next slide. Right, well, first of all, going back from the 1970s right up to about 2005, pretty much every alternator uh, was effectively a fixed voltage alternator which gave us 14.2 volts. What that meant was there was no problems associated with charging batteries, whether they were deep cycle batteries or wet cell batteries. There was no complications and pretty much every vehicle had the same standards, which meant batteries pretty much would be more century, inside or any other brand, all the batteries are pretty much the same. A lot's changed. The, the early days of smart alternators came out with what they call temperature compensating. And the concept there was very simple, that when the car was cold, you could turn the alternator off. The reason I did work because of the intervention of things called catalytic converters. And catalytic converters are effectively a thing that sits in the exhaust system and burns off some of the bad gases. And they don't work until they come up to a specific temperature. So consequently, turning off the alternator was a really good idea until you had the appropriate temperature. The next smart move is things like ECU controlled variable voltage or smart alternators. And typically, the vehicles that have been the most common with those have been things like Prados and 200s. Nowadays, things like the Mazda BT50 and obviously the Ford Ranger are getting a lot more intelligent in the alternator design. And I guess why this is important and why it's changed so much is that nowadays we all seek better fuel economy, we all want better power, we obviously need to have less emissions, otherwise, we're poisoning the planet. And one of those ways to achieve that is to actually turn off electrical loads to make less load on the motor than we possibly can. So smart alternators effectively aren't really all that smart. What they do is they just turn themselves off whenever they can possibly get away with it. What that means to us as small drivers, where we would have typically had a simple dual battery system, we now have a, a far more complicated dual battery system. Now, the changes in this technology are good in many, many, many ways because many cars are now starting to come out with calcium batteries, and calcium batteries are the next evolution from wet cell. So we'll quickly go through, we a slide on um, battery technology. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. How good is that? So up the top, we've got flooded of wet cells, which are our, our typical normal battery. Watch out. Um, yeah, that's the original technology. The calcium or flooded charging batteries are the newer technology that we see often nowadays. The spiral mount AGMs, like that orbital, or like the Optima battery, which is what a lot of people run these days, are actually really leading edge stuff. These batteries typically do a lot of really good things. They charge far more quickly. They do not leak or can't leak any acid because there's no acid as such inside of them. And for a given physical size, you gain an enormous amount higher uh, cold cranking amps, which means these batteries are absolutely awesome for running winches and running high amperage loads, which is absolutely terrific. Now, on the other side, you've got your AGM seal. The biggest thing with these batteries is they don't like going into engine bays, and that's one of the problems we have. Um, yeah, the AGM flat plane seal battery, that thing over there, is a brilliant battery, great for caravans and trailers, but not really good in an engine bay. If it gets too hot, you're going to shorten its life. And that brings me to a question that everybody asks me all the time, is how long should a battery last? 
Well, I guess that's a bit like how long the tyres last. I mean, it depends how you arrive and what you do. But just as a typical explanation there, a well looked after battery, good quality battery used in the right way, about three years. Uh, you might get four years out of it, and that's a really, really good result. Now, another question I get asked all the time is, people say, can I buy a factory battery like my car came? Because that battery lasted longer than any other battery I've ever had. It lasted for five years. Has anyone had that experience? Yeah, right, cool. Now, why do you think that original battery lasted so long? Is anyone have an idea? Okay, hands up, go. Anybody? Yeah. Warranty? No, not warranty. <laughs> yep. Everything's new in the car. Yes, yes. 100% pick a man a prize. Um, because everything is new and it's young and everything's perfect, that first battery will outlast every other battery you have. Not because the battery was better or better designed, simply everything was absolutely perfect. And it's never perfect after a few years old, believe me. So it's a good thing to remember. Yes? I had one in the wife's pulsar last 10 years. There you go, that's fantastic. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Yeah, when you're charging these different chemistry batteries, all these numbers underneath here tell you about the charging voltages that you need. They have different chemistries, and those different chemistries result in you needing different, different types of charges. So many of the smart charges have what they call an algorithm built into it, which is a bit like the old-fashioned flow chart having back at school, like a series of boxes going down. What it means is you put a pulse in, you see what happens, then you determine how to charge the battery. So the difference is very important. Smart alternators that we see in all the modern cars are typically designed to charge the factory battery that was put in there by the manufacturer. If that was a wet cell, you've got issues. If it was in fact an AGM or a calcium battery, you could charge anything you damn well like without any need to do anything expensive or expensive. And that's something that we've seen a lot of. Many people nowadays are putting in what they call VCDC charges, which actually are basically like a transformer. They step the voltage up, but they limit the amperage. And the reality is that you've got a 100 amp voltmeter like most of your Pajeros have, why would you want to cut it back to 20 or 40 amps? You simply wouldn't. And if that car's capable of charging at the right voltage, you don't need anything like a DC, DC or whatever charger in the previous state that you need. But the important thing to understand is when you're mixing chemistries, they don't always work in terms of compatibility. And that's one of the things I guess people really need to understand is, yep, hang on. When you, when you go and buy a battery, and you buy a better battery, like that AGM one, if your car was designed to run a wet cell, and you simply join it into the system, you bought a great battery, but it would never work properly. It's like putting premium leather into a diesel. It just doesn't work. You ruin the engine. So, yeah. Now, there's a question back there. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I've got a problem with the yellow top is that they don't like being charged up with about 100 amps. It's on the stick of phone. That's not actually correct. The limiting factor of the yellow top optimal is not the amperage of your alternator. The battery will limit how much charge it can absorb itself. So if you hook it on to, say, let's take a 100 amp charger, and you have an amps gauge on it, you'll notice that when it's relatively flat, it'll probably only be pulling a few amps, probably 20, 30. And once it gets at that middle stage, it'll probably pull 50, 60, 70 amps. And as it gets more and more charged, it will drop off right again. Now, a lot of people ask, don't understand that. I guess it's, it's a really simple analogy I had given to me many years ago. It's a very good one to remember. When you charge a battery, the sensible way you would fill a tank of water is from the top. But a battery is like filling a tank of water from the bottom. So consequently, when the battery is empty, there's no charge and it absorbs the energy relatively quickly. As the weight of the water increases, it gets higher and higher and higher. The resistance increases and it gets slower and slower and slower to charge. So that's a really good way to try and explain graphically that people understand how batteries charge. And I guess the thing is, the two elements that charge a battery are pressure and gallons per hour, if you think about it in terms of water. So voltage is your pressure, amperage is your gallons per hour. There's no use having bucket loads of pressure with no gallons per hour. There's no use having bucket loads of pre you know, volume, but at the wrong pressure, only bring it up to a certain level. Yeah. And the other thing too, just as a side comment from that is, Mod many modern cars now are coming out with calcium batteries. The reason for that is they last longer, they can sit them a lot longer. When they ship over from overseas and they go flat on the boat, and they are actually very, very clean to produce compared to the oil and acids. So they're really, really good things these days, and we're seeing them in most of the modern cars. Yeah. Uh, next slide, I think. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I've got a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, go. Yeah. The um, four-wheel drive specific batteries that are attached to uh, corrugation durability. Yeah, well, in, yeah, in, a, in a normal battery, like a car battery, like in your Falcon or Commodore, you'll have typically 
14, 16 plates per cell. We have a flooded wet cell battery, and there's really nothing special about it. A forward drive battery typically has what they call fiberglass separators in between the plates, and it's a little glue board all across the top and glue all across the bottom. What that does is stops the plates from vibrating and jumping around and shorting out and touching each other. And that is often called what they call vibrabond technology. That does make a battery more suitable for four wheel drive or marine, a boat going bang, 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 bang across the waves. So the four wheel drive batteries that you get in your cars as standard are actually that of that design. And when you buy an aftermarket battery, you should obviously go to a battery that's appropriate for your vehicle. And appropriate not just in the construction of the vibra bond, but also the correct chemistry as we talked about earlier. And this is where this next slide comes in. If you actually have a vehicle that has the lower voltage, like for the wet cells, and you want to change to AGMs because they're better, faster charging, last longer, don't leak, yada yada, this is a device that you can buy called an AOC, which is one of our inventions, which we'll show you a slide on shortly. But that enables you to get the alternator voltage up to the right voltage. Now, for most Pajeros, you don't need that because it's already got that technology built into it. But for vehicles like Prados and 200s, and there's another list we'll go through, that's where you need that sort of technology. Yeah, yeah, cool. Any uh, questions here? We'll keep going. Cool. Uh, next slide. Right. If you have a vehicle and you want, don't want a dual battery system in it, and you simply want to have more power for running your winch, you want to have power to run all those lovely accessories that people often want to run, like camera battery charging, phone battery charging, and other things. In many cases, people simply want to upgrade their, their simple starting battery to a larger capacity battery. And a good reason for that would be, for instance, you want to fit an electric winch to your vehicle. Now, again, many people put a dual battery system in, but some people don't want to. It might be a leased vehicle, whatever the case may be. Therefore, upgrading to a higher capacity battery is very important. If you want to run that high capacity battery and you've got a, a smart alternator, the AOC, which is an alternator output compensator, allows us to get the correct voltage into that battery at the full 100 amps of the alternator, and very importantly, without any temperature loss. Now, an AOC doesn't get affected by things like temperature, cold, heat, any of those things. The DC-DC device is going to get to 70 degrees, which is not terribly hot, they typically cut back to half the amount. So if you've got a 40 amp unit, you'll never have a 20 amp unit. That's not a lot of charging capacity if you've got a 100 amp alternator. So that's a very important thing. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, this is talking a little bit about battery isolators and dual battery systems. And I guess we should just touch on the dual battery side of things because that's probably one of the things we do most of these days. Is typically, most vehicles come, or all vehicles come with a standard starting battery. Many battery, battery, Many new cars come with twin starting batteries. Twin starting batteries is not a dual battery system. Now, a good example of some of those vehicles that have twin starting batteries would be the 200 series diesel Angrita. It's got a battery on either side. Each battery is 550 cca, gives you about 1100 volt cranking amps. And very simply, that car needs that sort of capacity to start. You can't separate them, therefore, make twin starting batteries into a dual battery system. Another example of that sort of vehicle would be some of the Sambaras that have starting batteries in them. Uh, some of the F trucks have twin starting batteries. The 100 series Land Cruiser with the diesel engines twin starting batteries. So they're becoming far more common. And that, just to clarify, is not a dual battery system. Now there's a legal side to this as well. Um, there have been people who have said, oh look, it's got twin batteries, that's a dual battery. It's not. Dual batteries means effectively one starts the engine, one runs your accessories. So they're electrically separated. And that's where these little boxes come in. These are called battery management charging systems, what well, they used to be called isolators in the old fashioned days. An isolator effectively means that one starts your engine, the other one runs your accessories, the battery's charged separately and independently, and you can't go running your fridge off your auxiliary, obviously flatten the starting battery in any form whatsoever. These devices that we've got up here are all Australian made, Australian designed, they're designed by us, built by the manufacturer. Very proud of those, just as a bit of a sideline history. Those things go to places like Kazakhstan, they go to Russia, they go to Germany, they go all around the world, they go to the U.S. even, which is pretty good for the Aussie to go into those markets. And it's very nice that they're all Australian made and designed. Cool. Move on, next slide. This is the AFC. I won't go over the walk on that at the moment, but basically uh, there's a slide or a video that will play with that later, so click on to the next one. Click on to the next one. Click on to the next one. Go past that. 
Um, we haven't done anything to talk about that, it's good. We'll go past that, go past that, go past that. Oh, stop, Triton. Yeah. Um, Triton, interesting vehicle. Many people have got Tritons here, or? Yeah, cool. Yeah, they're a good little vehicle. I'm actually bloody good value for money at the moment. I don't know why they're so cheap. It's quite amazing. I think friends are looking at great walls and have taught them to buy Tritons, and they're much happier for that anyway, moving sideways. In the Triton, we actually have a Somebody's left their lights on. What is it? 1CK. 1CY, 1CK. 1CY, 1CK. That is, yeah. So, 1CK. Well, What's the speaker, was it? What vehicle was it? Uh, it's mine. It's all right. There we are. Very good. Did you get some jumper leads out? I did not in my car, so there's a reason that I'm talking about that. Um, now, moving forward to the tri. In the Triton, you have your standard starting battery, which fits in, in the normal position. Behind it, we have a position to put in a 10-inch optimum battery. Now, the beautiful thing about it is the typical thinking will be the auxiliary battery is an extra battery you put in. But in a Triton, you can move one wire, which is the main wire, onto the auxiliary, what is the auxiliary position. You now can have a 105 amp hour running auxiliary battery, and you can use the smaller battery for starting the engine. So quite often, in the battery tray range, you can reverse things around, rethink what you're doing, and actually gain significant extra capacity. So when you look at our tray range, we have 160 different trays, and obviously lots and lots of different partners for different vehicles. But in that trident situation, a really good option is to swap them around. The same can be done in the Pajero. The, tall, the typical starting battery fits on the normal tray at the front. Our auxiliary tray goes behind it. You can actually put the starting battery down in there and now get a full-size 12-inch battery in. As I said, 105 amp hour instead of 55 amp hour, which is a really good thing to consider. So there's a bit of versatility goes on there. Okay, next slide. Ah, we were talking about the AOC thing before. Those are the vehicles that typically have got smart alternators that we see most commonly in the Australian market. There's a lot more coming along. We've got Prado 120, Prado 150, Hilux, Main Cruiser 200, 79 series, and all of the V8 diesels. And that's uh, quite interesting, actually. Okay, next slide, Bob. Ah, we don't need that. Well, we don't need that. No, we don't need that. Okay, next up with that. Okay, cool. Right, questions. Um, so, will the AOC simply boost the voltage or is there something more intelligent? It's, it's, it's more intelligent than that. Basically, what it does is it changes the signal between the body control module and the alternator to allow the alternator to charge at the appropriate voltage to the speed of the battery. So, it's quite a clever little device. And if I'm, uh, <coughs> for example, rather than a dual battery system, Trying to charge a battery in a caravan. Yep. Um, so I might have like a 1.5.6 voltage drop yep. uh, to the caravan. Will, will the AOC improve that? Yeah, it will. Um, the issue with his an AOC is if you put a BC DC device into the engine mode, typically it doesn't work terribly well because it doesn't like the temperature. And it also limits the ability of the alternator to charge the battery. When you have a long run of cable, I'm talking a very long run of cable, some of these caravans get quite large, they get quite long vehicles, you can talk five, six metres or even longer further away. No matter how heavy a cable you put in, they may never get the voltage up to that capacity. The second thing you've got to understand is in a trailer, you don't have to undermine the temperature to contain it. The third issue is that trailer could be towed by a whole range of different vehicles. It could be towed with a Gero, a Land Cruiser, a Hilux, or anything and the like. So if you're putting in a DC-DC or BC-DC into the trailer, it's got a high level of merit. Because it doesn't matter what you're getting out of your alternator, it will always give you the right voltage of that battery. But conversely, when you put that BC-DC device in the engine bay, you typically end up with it not working anywhere near as well as you would hope it would. So it's a case of horses for horses. So hopefully that answers that question. The other just side part to that is the right device, and there's a whole range to choose from, may have solar panel input, alternating input, and it will actually manage the two of those together to give you the best possible outcome, which is clever. Because if you have a solar panel reg of your solar panels and then you do some DC, you may end up finding one cancels the other one out and leave nothing happening. So, it's not good to have it all. so it's choosing the right products, yeah. Yeah? Um, you were talking about, uh, Alan, calcium batteries. <clears throat> you were talking about calcium batteries and the uh, fact that they're a much better option, calcium plug batteries. 
Looking at the voltage, they work from about 13.8 to 14.4. But they like the high voltage, yeah. Are they able to be put in a car that comes standard with a, an acid flux battery? If it's a normal wet, wet cell battery, wet cell typically in the olden days it would have gone to 14.2 volts. So therefore, 14.2 to 44 makes no difference, you're fine. But when it's a smart alternator that's only giving you 13.6, it simply won't charge. And this is a really important thing. People talk about warranties and failures. It's not that it failed, it was doomed to success from the day one. It was never going to work. And that's where either the AOC or the BCDC device becomes absolutely essential. So if it had a wet cell battery in it, yep. is that calcium flood battery okay? It depends on the vehicle. Right. Okay. Let, okay, let's be specific. So many of the new Land Rovers that are coming in have all got calcium batteries in them. Many of the Jeeps have actually got optional batteries in them. The new uh, D-Max, uh, Colorado, all those vehicles, they all have the technology to run the calcium perfectly, no problems at all. Many of the older vehicles can run calcium perfectly as well. It's just some of those vehicles in that list before, with those so-called smart alternators, have a 13.6 charge rate, which means you put a calcium in, you're guaranteed failure. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Any more? Uh, just uh, talking about solar charging, do you find the difference in the batteries when solar charge better? Yeah. Like I've found, uh, I, I believe wet cell charge better than the um, the AGMs and all that. So. Well, the thing you've
cranking battery might have 700 cranking amps, the deep cycle might have 280. The amp out capacity on this would be quite low. The amp out capacity that could be 80, 90, even 100 amps. So therefore, its ability to run something at a low load for a long period of time is much greater. <coughs> Typically, the problem with deep cycle batteries, which is why many people don't like them, is they take a long time to recharge. Typically, six, seven hours, which means you've got to drive for a bloody long way to get that battery back up to full charge again. The reason why people go cranky cranky is they recover very quickly. But the downside, this is the big downside, flattening a starting battery four times in a row and it's kind of it's never going to recharge again. That's because the cells of water and stored touch each other at short out and it will never recover. It's a rubbish big job. You can flatten the deep cycle battery hundreds and hundreds of times and it will recover. It will, it will suffer a little bit, but it will recover. So I guess it's People ask, what's the best battery? And the real answer is, what's best for your application, really? And if you're talking about fridges and things, uh, many of the modern fridges have got low voltage cutouts, so therefore the need for deep cycle isn't quite as great. But having said that, if it is going to get flat, you won't be able to deep cycle. So if you're out in the bush, you can't go buy another battery in a hurry. The other thing, too, and this is just a dual question, is will a deep cycle start my car? The answer is yes, it definitely will start the car. Will it start it well? No, I never said that. But it will, it will start the car, it will get you out of the food, yes. I, I must admit I've never used a second battery to start my car because I've never had the need. Well, that's right, because you've got a battery system. It runs all the accessories, that's you know, right. fridges, and what you say, charges for batteries, and CVs, and all that sort of stuff. Driving lines and that if you drive them at night. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, I think probably in hindsight, I've never actually flattened the, the second battery flat flat no. that it's got down and the angle is cut out at yeah. 11.5 or 11.3 yeah. or whatever yeah. it is. So, you know, that's probably saved it. It's safe, it's good, yeah. It's all about, yeah, all about having fun in the bush reliably, knowing your car can start. There's a couple of things I want to touch bases on which are quite important. A lot of people come in and they buy those little battery jump start packs and you see them around the little few things and they're absolutely frigging remarkable. Something the size of a pack of cars can start a diesel engine. Now, I've had people come in to me and say, look, I don't think I need a dual battery system. I can buy one of these lithium pack things for $100 instead of spending $1,000 and I'll use that to start myself. Do you reckon there might be a bit of a flaw in that thinking? <coughs> what do you reckon the flaw might be in that thinking? Well, as we answer this chap's question, flatten your starting battery four times and it's absolutely destroyed. Mm. So if you flatten it four nights in a row when you're camping, you're now relying totally on this little lithium ion thing to try and start a buggered battery. It may not happen. Now, it may, it may possibly start. I've done a lot of testing on these. I've got a diesel <coughs> Land cruiser. And a little tiny thing can actually start the cruiser. Mind you, when it's warm and it's been running previously, when it's been parked all night out in the, in the freezing cold in winter time, it doesn't work. So those little bit little with the alarm things are terrific, great for charging up phones and other things like that. Great for putting your back pocket as an extra power source and definitely will start an engine. We're up at the Kimberleys recently, had a guy driven where he wasn't supposed to. We weren't going to go down there and take a sign with the car because it was really, really bad. So we walked down the little field and packed and got his car started and he got him out. So they do work them out a good thing, but they're not a substitute and you should never consider it as an absolute reliable way of starting a vehicle just in case it bothers with it. So just I'll mention that as a side thing. Yeah, I reckon we've, had, we've got about 100 more questions, I reckon, but um, uh, what we might do is uh, go to the video. Yep, we can um, go to the video. Are you going to go? Yep, can we um, make that one work? With the video, it's pretty crappy, and I'll just explain about this. Um, but we may not listen to it all, it goes for a few minutes, but I'll just, just try and make it run and I'll talk. Um, back in 2000, we were given a challenge a long time ago, and people said, here we are, the year 2000, and we still don't have electric cars. And I said, we've got George Jetson stuff, and we haven't gone very far, still driving the Geros and Land Cruisers and things. Anyway, so I thought, well, why don't we build an electric car? Well, I looked into it, and it was just out of the question. It was expensive, it was difficult, and it wouldn't work, it was a waste of time. Anyway, 2015 came, and I'm getting old, and I thought, you know, I'm going to take this challenge, and I like challenges. So we decided we'd actually be challenged by Dave Cox from Mount Dare to build an electric car that could cost the Simpson Desert running only off solar energy. And the second part of the challenge was we weren't allowed to spend like $50,000 on it. Well, there's two good reasons for that. I don't have $50,000. <laughs> and secondly, I, I think that's a really good way to make it affordable. So we went out and bought a second-hand forklift, pulled the engine out of it, stuck it into the system, 
and we built the first ever electric powered Suzuki. Anyway, to, to tell you what was a disaster was an understatement. We, we, we had two motors in the forklift. There's one that makes the mast go up and down, and there's one that pushes it along. Now, the one that puts the mast up and down was smaller, lighter, and more powerful. So what a big dummy here did, we put that motor into it, of course. We wired the thing up, and it looks like a winch motor, so it's got, you know, field one and field two, so it should go forwards and backwards. Anyway, put the bloody motor in it, wired the thing up, and the thing flew backwards at about 80 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> so, we thought, what is it? That's a bit embarrassing. So anyway, we've got, we've got one more motor to put in it. We've got this dirty, great big 93 kilogram DC electric motor, which was the driveway around this forklift. We shoved that into the thing, and the horses leaking nearly had a hernia. Anyway, cutting a long story short, we made it work. It actually works. And if this silly video will play, you'll get, I won't play the whole thing for you, give you an idea. We drove for 700 kilometres up to Murrayville, which is up on the border, and then dragged a friggin' tandem trailer with 13 inch wheels, and don't ever do that through the desert, for 100 k's, to get this filthy great intelligent. Is there sound? Anyway, I might make you watch the whole thing. 
could only go for a few minutes, but that June we tried to do some troopy on it, and after many, many attempts, the troopy couldn't get up. And his stupid little electric thing did it seven goes until battery voltage went down too low. It was just absolutely amazing. So we now set up really have a crack at the Simpson Desert. It pulls about 190 amps on a big steep hill, about 80 amps on the flat, and uh, the batteries charge up totally off solar. And we're out there for world record, for Guinness Book of Records, Australian Geographic, National Geographic. And um, it's all just, we're doing it purely off our own back just because we can. And we've named it the Sue's Leaky Track. <laughs> uh, July of this year. So it's pretty exciting. So look guys, thank you very much. Well, we do love all things electric and uh, there's nothing that stops us. We have lots of fun. I hope you enjoyed the talk and if you have any further questions, thanks guys. All the very best. Uh, fantastic. Um, uh, hopefully Alan will stay around after the meeting. Yep. But uh, thank you again. That was fantastic. And uh, I look forward to seeing the video of Simpson. Yes. <laughs>